soon as my controls are a little slow today. So here we go. We're going to resume. Welcome, everybody. It is so great to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner and the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today we're going to dive in for the next 30 minutes into voting rights in America. This is a big topic, so I hope you're ready for it. We're going to fly through, like Tom says, from the Declaration of Independence all the way to COVID and walk through all the different parts of the Constitution, including lots of amendments and how they've changed our understanding and our Constitution around voting in America. To do this, we are here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center. Tom, would you like to say hi? Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Donnelly. I am one of the center's uh, senior fellows for constitutional studies and can't wait to talk about this, uh, this story of voting rights in America. So Tom, we have a lot to go over today and I love this quote from Harry Truman that's a part of our class. A vote is the best way of getting the kind of country and the kind of world you want. But to really understand the vote in America and some of the big questions we have around it, we need to look across time and across the constitution. So some of the questions that we're gonna to answer today is what does the original, that structural constitution say about voting rights? What did constitutional amendments, how did the constitutional amendments transform voting rights and the relationship between the constitution and voting in our country? And what are the relative roles of the national government and the state governments around voting in the states? All of this stuff is a lot to go through, but Tom, would you like to start with the Constitution and do a quick walkabout? Of course, as, as always, we will start with the Constitution's text. And as you can see on the screen right now, there are many, many, many provisions of the Constitution that touch on elections and voting. We're just gonna highlight some of the biggest ones um, and let's start with the structural constitution, the original constitution. Um, you know, here it's those first four provisions Curry has up there and to walk through them quickly, Article 1, Section 2 speaks to who's going to vote for members of the U.S. House of Representatives. And so what we he see here is a rule that sets that the qualifications for voters in those election is, the elections, it's going to match the qualifications for voters in the lower house of the state legislature of each state. And so why is this important? Why is this significant? Well, it roots the U.S. House of Representatives power in that principle of popular sovereignty, rule by we the people. So the American people themselves are going to vote directly for who's going to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. And importantly, the Constitution is going to say the rules that count in those elections, we're going to use the same rules that states use in their most democratic branch of government. And so it lodges right there in the original Constitution for its time, a very, very, very democratic rule. So that's the U.S. House, that's Article 1, Section 2. Article 1, Section 3 then speaks to the U.S. Senate. Because remember, with Article 1, we divide the legislative power of the national government between the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. And the U.S. Senate in Article 1, Section 3 sets out that the U.S. Senators under the original Constitution are going to be selected by the state legislatures. So what's the organizing principle for the Senate that we find in Article 1, Section 3? Well, the U.S. House was popular sovereignty the Senate is going to be based on equal representation of the states. And so this, again, remember, this means that whether you're New York and you're a very large state or you're Rhode Island and a very small state, you're going to get two U.S. senators. So we're going to have equal representation in the Senate by state. And importantly, too, these senators are going to be selected originally by the state legislatures. And so here we see the Senate becoming central to the original Constitution and the founders' vision of federalism the Senate is going to end up representing to a certain extent the voice of the states. So if the House is the voice of the people, the Senate is the voice of the states. We'll see later with the 17th Amendment that we alter that structure a bit, but that's the original vision. Turning to Article 1, Section 4, this revision sets out that the time, place, and manner of elections are going to be set by the states subject to regulation by Congress. So what does this mean? Why is this significant? Well, it establishes the primacy of the states, that when, we when it comes to the rules that are going to govern elections and voting, the states are going to have the main responsibility. It's going to be their primary duty. Of course, Congress can step in and regulate these matters, but originally this is going to be really a job for the states. And again, this is another part of that original constitution, the, fra famer the framers' version, uh, vision of federalism, the idea it's, it's a state power story to a certain extent with the federal government providing a backstop. And then finally, the last piece of the, the Structural Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, gives us the Electoral College. 
This is how we select the president. If you want to hear more about that than you'd ever want to know, you could look at our previous weeks on the Electoral College and the presidency. But there you can see in the, in the structural constitution, there is no statement of a, of a right to vote in the original constitution. We don't have one in the Bill of Rights either, but what we do see are various provisions that are going to govern how we're going to select members of the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and the presidency. I'll pause there, Curry, before we get to the amendments uh, to take any questions or, or anything else you'd like to bring in. Yeah, so I think that's great. So that frames out the original constitution. So the constitution that is written in the summer of 1787, and it lays out how elections are going to work, but it doesn't say who exactly is voting. And it doesn't spell out voting rights directly. Is that a true statement, Tom? That's a true statement. And the one thing I'll add, Curry, is, you know, if, if we're looking for like, what's the organizing big idea that we want to bring out here in the original constitution, is that the original constitution really left voting issues largely to the states. And so really just have in mind, it's a federalism story. It's a state power story. We're leaving a lot of these big questions in the state's hands. Awesome. So that's great. So it's 1787, you know, or, you know, this time period, are there states, most of the states are going to choose who they allow to vote. So who are they letting to vote in this time period in say, um, let me pick like Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts during this time period, who typically is allowed to vote? So yeah, let, I, 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 let me, I'll give you sort of like the what's, this, what's the majority rule in almost every state and then some of the yes. outliers we see in this period. And guys, this time period, we're looking at right after the constitution is ratified, this time period voting in America. Because this the fun part of this game, who can vote, you jump around at different time periods and you find out way different information. And it's not as straight linear path that you would think. So framing the time period right after the constitution is ratified, go. Absolutely. So, and, and Curry, I can even extend it back a little further. We can say, you yes. know, from 1776, the declaration to this early period, say around the constitution in the early 1800s, who's allowed to vote? What's the main rule? Well, the founding generation, the main, so, so one, again, remember, we're leaving these questions largely to the states. But if you're looking broadly at, you know, what is the, what, what, what is the founding generation's key rule? What's the rule in most of these states? is that we're going to limit the right to vote to white male property holders. That's gonna mostly be who votes in, in, in virtually, not virtually, in, in the vast majority of the states during the period is gonna be white male property holders, but that's not exclusively true. And so we already see around, right around when the constitution is, is ratified here, when we get when in 1780s, 1790s, we see some states moving away from this. And so we see Vermont and states like Vermont and Pennsylvania getting rid of property requirements. And for a state like Vermont, this is actually really important because Vermont has already decided to abolish slavery as well. And so this allows African-Americans who, who, who are in the state are free um, uh, to vote in those elections. And so we see, again, the, the, the vast majority of states are limiting the vote to white male property holders, but we see other states like Vermont and a few others allowing African-Americans to vote. My home state of New Jersey um, allows women to vote if they're property holders um, all the way up until 1807. And so, you know, again, the two things I'd want to emphasize are one, for the founding generation, it's largely white male property holders that are able to vote. But two, there are exceptions to this rule with African and free African Americans allowed to vote in some states, and also women in New Jersey who own property allowed to vote. Awesome. I love that framing because now we're going to look at how that changes over time. But before we do that, I say we have a little quick quiz. Um, I want to see how the students, what their comfort level is with um, the amendments, because there's a lot of amendments that we're going to go through. And I have just a quick poll on some of the amendments. So let me pick the correct poll. And it is guess the amendment poll. So I'm going to launch it now, gang. I will read the questions out loud as well. So if you can see the poll, answer it. If you can't, I will read the questions and you can answer in the chat. So I hope you're ready. Here we go. So the question number one, this amendment is ratified in 1870 and says that the right to vote cannot be denied by race, which means it bans racial discrimination in voting. So this is 1870. Uh, which amendment is it? Is it the 13th amendment or is it the 15th amendment? So if you're answering in the chat, go now. The first question is, which amendment said you cannot stop somebody from voting based on race? 13th Amendment or 15th Amendment? These are hard. Next question. 
Second question, this amendment grants women the right to vote and is passed in 1920. Only a hundred years ago, ladies, only a hundred years. Which amendment is it? Is it the 17th amendment or is it the 19th amendment? So second question, which is the amendment that allows women the right to vote and it's passed in 1920? 17th amendment or 19th amendment? Okay, last question. This amendment is ratified in 1865 and it ends poll taxes in national elections. Which amendment is it? This is a hard one. Is it the 24th amendment or the 26th amendment? So I'll let you guys take your guesses and we're gonna make Tom answer all of them and tell us what everything is. So if you have that worksheet, get it out. Here we go. So Tom, this amendment is ratified in 1870 and says that the vote cannot be denied based on race. Is it the 13th Amendment and the 15th Amendment? Why don't you tell us what both of those are? Sure. The answer is that is the 15th Amendment. It bans racial discrimination in voting. The 13th Amendment was the transformative amendment ratified after the Civil War that abolished slavery in the United States. Awesome. Very good. So 13th and slavery, 15th, it says you cannot deny on the base of race. Okay, second question. This amendment grants women the right to vote and it's passed in 1920. Is it the 17th or 19th amendment? So which one is it? Is it 17th or 19th? It's the 19th amendment, the, uh, that, that bans uh, gender discrimination in voting. The 17th amendment provides for the popular election of the US Senate. So it's no longer, we don't have senators selected by state legislatures anymore, but instead by the American people directly. Got it. So 19th says women have the right to vote and 17th says direct election of senators. Tom did mention it earlier, um, but we know this is a hard one. Okay, last question flying through the amendments. This amendment is ratified in 1965 and ends poll taxes. So first of all, real quick, what is a poll tax, Tom? A poll tax is just, uh, it's a requirement to pay a, a fee before you can vote. Um, and so this is important because all throughout the South after Reconstruction, um, white Southerners use poll taxes to try to keep African-Americans from the polls. It's one of those devices used to undermine the promise of the 15th Amendment. Got it. So which, what, which amendment ends poll tax, the 24th or the 26th? It's the 24th Amendment. The, uh, the 26th Amendment um, promises the right to vote for those 18 and older. And I just want to, we, we don't often talk about this one, but you know, it's important to realize when we ratified the 26th Amendment, most states still limited voting to those 21 and older. And so it's with the 26th Amendment, we set the baseline at 18 year olds and it's during Vietnam and, and people are really responding to people, to, to people serving in Vietnam, risking their lives for their country, but not being old enough to vote. And so we corrected that and ratified the 26th Amendment faster than any other amendment in the constitution it took under four months. Awesome. So we, we snuck in a lot of amendments there and we might have we might have missed a few. And I know we probably missed your favorite, Tom. So do you want to just share the uh, around the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment, kind of the power of the 14th Amendment and how it's connected to voting? Sure. Yes. So so we, we said 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, 15th Amendment, African-American voting rights in the middle is the 14th Amendment, which I always like to say, it, it, it wrote the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. It did more than that, but it certainly did that. And what we see with the 14th Amendment over time is that the Supreme Court, as we get into the 20th century, um, so the 1900s, is the Supreme Court ends up uh, saying that voting is a fundamental right under the 14th Amendment, and then uses the 14th Amendment to attack different voting laws that they see as undermining the right to vote, and especially undermining the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. And so whereas the 15th Amendment is the explicit protection for African-American voting rights, we see the Supreme Court often using the 14th Amendment as well and its promise of equality uh, to strike down various, uh, various voting laws over time. So, okay, so we have a lot of amendments on the books and I think um, one of Ms. Cunningham's students pointed out a really good point. So. Women were allowed to vote in, uh, vote in New Jersey if they had property ownership. But the question there was, don't, didn't most women, they were not allowed to own property at that time? So was that almost like a, like a not a true power that they could have because the likelihood of a woman owning property was so low? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely a great point. And it, it, it's, you know, we, we, we see all throughout this period in the early to mid 1800s, women fighting first actually for property rights. 
for property rights on equal in an equal equal basis with men, while they're also beginning to really fight for the right to vote. But the two of them were intertwined at the founding. So they're actually intertwined for women's rights advocates and suffragists in the 1800s generally. So that's a really great, that's a great point and a very, very insightful thing to see for sure. Yeah, super smart gang. Um, so jumping now, like we kind of covered that structural constitution, we dabbled in the amendments, but you know, we have this base constitution that starts off and it's really mostly, like you said, most of the states, it's gonna be white male property owners. So when we talk about property owners, that means you, you typically have wealth to be able to have property. So we have white male property owners, but things start to change. Do you wanna to jump to Jackson and kind of walk our students through the 1800s into the 1900s and get to that modern hypothetical? Sure, in no time at all, we will do that. Uh, you know, the, the one thing I will emphasize before even we get to Jackson, Curry, is I'd love to telegraph what I think to be sort of the big takeaway about the amendments themselves. Uh, so this story we just talked about. So if the original constitution is all about the primacy of the states and state power, what we see in the amendments are two key trends. One of them is that we're bringing more and more people into the story of we the people through the amendments with the 15th amendment through race, the 19th amendment, gender, the 26th amendment, younger voters. And so we see an expansion of the right to vote to more and more groups written into the constitution. That's one big point. The other is that each of these amendments also have a, a, a part of that amendment, which, which uh, clearly gives power to Congress to enforce the commands of the amendment. And so whereas the original constitution and the Bill of Rights is largely about limiting the powers of the national government, preserving the powers of the states, amendments like the, the 14th, 15th, 19th, 26th, are all giving new powers to Congress. It be, it's still the same old story. It's still a battle, battle between what can the national government do and what can the states do, but it's giving the national government more power than it had before. So I'll sort of just, I, I wanted to leave there before we got to Jackson. I think that's really important because the, the constitution is now empowering Congress to say, we're saying these people can vote and your job is to ensure that they're not being limited. And the question is always, do they use that power? Do they take that power? And how does that play out? So jumping the jacks back to Jackson just for a minute, because this is really when we see the vote start to expand, at least for some people in our country and contract for others in a way. Yeah, and so yeah, it's it, it, it sort of, it ends up being a, a, a two level story at the very least. So I mean, the way, so it's the Jacksonian age, it's the 1820s and 1830s. We see great changes to how elections and voting work in the United States. And the bottom line is that one of the trends is that we see a move towards universal white male suffrage. So what does this mean? It's, it, it's very simple. States are getting rid of pop property requirements. If you're a poor white man, you're now given the right to vote in states across the United States. This wasn't true at the founding, but it is true in the age of Jackson. And so it's a, it's a, it's a good time for poor white men. If you weren't able to vote before, you can vote now. But the other trend line that we see there is that we still see restrictions on many other groups, including women, and African-Americans. So you see one strand where you're seeing new restrictions on voting for African-Americans and immigrants. Uh, they become more prevalent during this period. And so as we're on the eve of the Civil War, 1855, we only see five states that allow African-American voting, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. So it's really a New England phenomenon. So it's not nothing, it's not zero, uh, but it is a New England phenomenon. But what about women? We see Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott on the screen. What are the, what's, what's going on among women during this period? Well, we already saw New Jersey took away women's right to vote in 1807, but we see as we get to the middle of the 1800s, the beginning of uh, a real push for the women's vote. And it goes hand in hand, as I said earlier, with a push towards greater property rights for women as well. So you're seeing both a push for property rights and voting. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott are significant to the story because in 1848, uh, they, they put together a convention at Seneca Falls. So this is the famous Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York, um, where you, you have both women and men who support greater equality for women coming together and trying to settle on a statement of their principles, a statement on what they really are going to fight for, what they believe in. And it's, it's, it comes to Elizabeth Cady Stanton to draft the, the, the famous document there, which is called the Declaration of Sentiments. And it's an amazing, it's not a particularly long document. I urge you to find it online and read it for yourselves. She ends up, as you could even see here from the quote, she, she, she effectively rewrites the Declaration of Independence. And here's the powerful quote Curry has on the screen. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. So they're looking to re, re, you know, sort of reclaim the American founding for both men 
and women. And they're drawing on the arguments from the, the American Revolution, the revolutionary age, those, those, the, the belief in equality and natural rights and saying that women are part of that story and women should be able to vote. And it's an amazing document because here you have, if the Declaration of Independence had all of these grievances, all these wrongs that the, the colonists thought King George III did, well, Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, well, I'm gonna rewrite that except for all of the things men are doing to women. And so it's a statement of grievances against men written into this amazing document, the Declaration of Sentiments. And it includes in the end 12 demands, which are setting an agenda for the women's rights movement. And this includes equal education, equal pay, property rights, but importantly for us, it also includes, quote, the sacred right to the elective franchise. And so we see here the seeds of the women's suffrage movement that's good. Again, we know, we know the 19th Amendment's not ratified until 1920, that's 70 years later. So we have decades and decades of fights to go, but we see the seeds of it here. And it's an interesting way in which Stanton and the suffragists are looking back to the revolution, to the declaration, um, while also looking ahead to what they think America can be. The last thing I'll say about this period before we fast forward to after the Civil War, Curry, is we also see it, 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 it in the eve of the Civil War in 1857, the Dred Scott decision, where the That's Supreme what I Court- to do. Thank you. I was like, let's talk about this case, because I think this case, when you talked about, like, we have this New England phenomenon um, going on, this case blows up the ability for African American men to be able to vote, because what does it say at the end of the case is decided, what is the foundation? And, I have to be honest, I love the Dred Scott case. I find it fascinating. I find that it's so interesting, but I, I was, sometimes I didn't click the fact that the outcome of the case changes voting rights for African-Americans in the New England states. So I know we were talking about cases that we would um, go through today. And I wanna hit this one really quickly because it's an important one to know for so many topics in American history. So yeah, so the case just very quickly involves Dredd and Harriet Scott, who were enslaved people. They're petitioning for their freedom. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but you see a lot of these cases during this period of African Americans who were enslaved petitioning for freedom. And so the core of why this case matters for our question today is that what the Supreme Court goes out of its way to say is that African Americans are not United States citizens. And as Chief Justice Roger Taney infamously said, African Americans had, quote, no rights which the white man was bound to respect. And so this is a foundation, uh, you know, Dred Scott here, uh, really denying any form of citizenship, not just not equal citizenship, but any citizenship to African Americans. And we so frequently see voting rights connected to this idea of American citizenship. And so they're untethering it here in Dred Scott. And then Curry has this powerful dissent by Justice John McLean. Um, uh, the other thing to note about Dred Scott is there are two powerful dissents, one by McLean, one by Benjamin Curtis. And what they both focus on, it's interesting. They look back at the American founding and American constitutional history. And uh, whereas the majority says, you know, African-Americans have never really had citizenship rights in the United States. It'd be ridiculous to think otherwise. McLean and Curtis say, look to history. African-Americans could go to vote at the founding. They could vote through every decade up all the way up until Dred Scott. What in the world are you talking about? And so you see this conflict between, you know, one, uh, you know, sort of a principled distinction of what sort of citizenship rights African Americans could have, but also a debate over this history. Um, and so it's a really interesting way in which you often see this, where it's it's two sides arguing at a, arguing both a matter of principle, but also really at the base level of history itself. And I, and I think that's really important because what they're what he's saying in here is like look at the precedent, and we talk about that a lot in class. What happened before? What's the norm? And they're saying the president is this. So by putting this in, that is not true. Um, so, and I know we're gonna dive into this deeply in November. We're gonna look at the constitution. We're gonna look at slavery in America. And we're gonna look at those reconstruction amendments in deep detail in November. But really quickly, when we think about, you know, voting rights for African-American males and then looking at this like lens of the 14th around it, we want to quickly walk through the reconstruction amendments just one more time, Tom. This is Tom's area of expertise and his favorite. So I know he loves it, but I also think it's really important to make sure we understand the Dred Scott case and then the changes to that Supreme Court decision and that the had to happen through the amendment process. So back at you. You can, never, you can never talk too many times or too often about the Reconstruction Amendments. So these, again, these are the amendments that we ratify after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. At a fundamental level, one way to understand them is it's the, it's the, you know, the party of Lincoln after the Civil War saying, no, 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 Chief Justice Taney and Dred Scott Court, you were wrong. And you were so wrong, we're going to write what's right 
right, what's right, <laughs> into the Constitution. We're going to write new constitutional principles in there, set new baselines to make it clear that Dred Scott, it was wrong when it was decided, but it's sure... Uh, it, it sure is wrong after we put these amendments in the Constitution. So these amendments, again, the 13th abolishes slavery. The 14th writes the, pro the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. The 15th ends racial discrimination in voting. I guess it's, it's worth pausing just for a second on this, that last one, the 15th Amendment, because it, it is you know, at the core of the beginning of this voting rights story that we're going to see for the rest of, you know, all the way up to modern times, really. So with the 15th Amendment, we're deciding to, to ban racial discrimination in voting. And, you know, I, I, there's this great quote by abolitionist w Wendell Phillips explaining why, the, why is the vote so important to people during this period? Women are fighting for it. African-Americans are fighting for it. Republicans are trying to decide after the Civil War who is part of the we the people that have to be able to vote. And Wend Wendell Phillips says, a man with a ballot in his hand is the master of the situation. He defines all his other rights. What is not already given to him, he takes. The ballot is opportunity, education, fair play, right to office, elbow room. And you see Frederick Douglass making the same sorts of arguments. Francis Harper, the great uh, women's rights uh, uh, advocate and advocate of racial equality, making similar arguments. And so here, what the Reconstruction Republicans do are write that promise of racial equality in voting into the Constitution through the 15th Amendment. Now, during this, you know, the, 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 the Congress debates between a broader amendment that's going to cover not just, you know, discrimination against racial discrimination, but other things like discrimination uh, based on property, education, a broader amendment that even each House of Congress passes. But in the end, they, they, they compromise around an amendment that focuses on ending racial discrimination in voting. Um, you know, there were some more radical voices in Congress, like one of my heroes, Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, who abstained from voting for the, for the 15th Amendment precisely because he said it didn't go far enough. It's good, it's good enough to say, it's great, don't get me wrong. Ending racial discrimination in voting in America is a huge transformation that would have been completely unthinkable before the Civil War. And so I, I wanna pause and say it is a transformational amendment, but you have people like Senator Charles Sumner saying, we should, we should also make it clear that we're not gonna discriminate based on property education because you know what at, at a certain point in time white southerners are going to come back into this government they're going to be not be happy that african americans are allowed to vote and they're going to use devices like poll taxes which require them people to pay money literacy tests which require people to prove that they're literate um, and things like that to deny them the right to vote um, and so Sumner wa wanted a broader amendment um, and he you know the right. last the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, and, 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 and the lesson, so the, yeah, the, 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 key, the key final point, the coda to this, the end to it, is that on the one hand, the 15th Amendment and this Reconstruction moment worked for a short period of time, too short a period of time, but it did work. We had African-American governors, we had African-American senators, members of Congress, and all the way down to local levels, African-American sheriffs and justices of the peace, we saw a genuine experiment in interracial democracy in America. But as we know, this was too short a period because we do see white, white Southerners come back to political power. We see them use a mix of violence and Jim Crow to keep African-Americans from the polls. And so we wanna both, as we think about this moment, celebrate the transformation that was done to the Constitution's text, celebrate the experiment in interracial democracy where we really do see African-Americans taking political power in the South for the first time ever, while not forgetting the limits of it. And we'd have to fight, of course, another century all the way through the civil rights movement to realize the promise of the 15th Amendment. Now, Tom, let me see if I'm doing this right, but like, I, I think that, so like, I love this about Sumner because I my question when I was a kid was always like, did they know this was coming or was it something they didn't even think of? Uh, and nice job, uh, Margaret, in the email. I look at this image and this is an engraving of the first vote, um, 1867. We know that African-American male voting helped turn the tide with the presidential election. Um, it with Grant. And then we jump really quickly to just, is this the, the year on this, 1895? That's what it looks like, yes. And that yeah. would make sense. I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing like the real spread of these Jim Crow laws in the 1890s and at the turn into the 20th century. So it is like, it, it, it is a decent amount of time that you're seeing African-Americans vote in the South. What's so interesting about that first image, Curry, is it's important to remember African-Americans are voting before the 15th Amendment. So this is under a law passed by Congress that forced uh, Southern, Southern states to allow African-Americans to vote. And it's African-Americans voting for Grant. It's African-Americans voting to ratify the 14th Amendment and then the 15th Amendment. And so African-Americans are playing a key role in all of these fights even before the, the uh, 15th Amendment is ratified. 
So you get this, this boom and this burst and you have Congress using the enforcement power that it gets with the 14th, that it gets with the 15th to do this. And then you have what Sumner knew was coming, which was the rollback, that pushback, the Jim Crow laws, all these pieces. And it, it's happening for African-American men, it's happening for women and African-American women, but, and I know we have like five minutes left and I wanna to get to the a current question on this, but I didn't wanna negate that it's also, uh, the Indian Citizenship Act, Congress doesn't use this power and just begins to use it in 1924 to allow Native Americans the ability to vote as well. Yeah, and, and so yeah, this is the last part, not the last part, this is an additional part of the story where it's with 1924, it's where Congress is saying all Native Americans are, are citizens. And so this is actually, once again, it's a response to military service in part. You have Native Americans serving in the military during World War I, and then it eventually spurs this, but it's not until 1957 that Utah becomes the last state to legalize Native American voting. And so it's this two, again, it's sort of this two prong of citizenship, um, but finally securing voting rights in, in 1957 in all of the states of the union. And I do think it's so fascinating how the, the fight and the wars, you know, you fight for your country and you fight for your independence, you come back, you can't vote. And that has to do with the African-American story as well between World mm -hmm. War I and World War II. And then we see Congress really really finally using that power in those amendments with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So real quick, Voting Rights Act of 1965, I know I give you like a second to do these big ones. No, it's fine. And so this is, this is one of the transformational amendments that grows out of the civil rights movement. So this is the end of it, Congress you know, passing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This is after decades upon decades of advocacy by African-Americans, including the heroic march uh, in Selma with the late John Lewis. Um, uh, and, and so what, what this effectively does is it's finally the big law that, that you know, attacks G, uh, uh, Jim Crow laws in the South. It places, any, it places states um, uh, that have bad records on racial discrimination and voting under the supervision of the national government. So what this means is if, if you've been bad, especially on African-American voting rights in decades past, what we're gonna do is we're going to one, we're gonna ensure people can attack the laws that you've passed in courts. But two, if you wanna change your laws again, you have to come to the national government, show us your laws and we have to give you permission to do it. And so this is called preclearance, but it ends up being very strong medicine where it keeps, because there are all sorts of ways as we learn from poll taxes, literacy tests, all of these ways that don't say anything about race, but end up discriminating against people based on race or other characteristics. And so with the Voting Rights Act, we're saying no. Um, and what this effectively does is uh, it expands voting rights massively. Uh, among African Americans, especially in the South. It's a transformative law. It's a big, 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 big deal. It's impossible to overstate it. And so what we end up seeing in the courts, one, we see one early challenge to this, because remember, this is the national government taking on huge responsibilities in voting. We're not in the founding uh, uh, mindset anymore where the states are, 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 are primary. And so this is very strong constitutional medicine. South Carolina comes to the Supreme Court says, this is unconstitutional. This goes against all of our traditional powers to, to, to set elections and voting rules. Uh, it's unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court says, no, South Carolina, you're wrong. In a decision by Chief Justice Earl Warren, which says this is exactly within the core of what the 14th and 15th amendments were about. This is a case called South Carolina versus Katzenbach. And it says, yes, this is strong constitutional medicine, but yes, it's also constitutional. And so that's South Carolina versus Katzenbach saying the Voting Rights Act is constitutional. Fast forward to a more recent case in uh, 2013, Shelby, Shelby County versus Holder, where we're debating similar issues about federalism, but you know, we're many, many decades after the Voting Rights Act, Voting Rights Act has worked. And the question is, you know, Congress over time has, uh, has, has had to approve the Voting Rights Act a few different times. And the question is whether or not the strong medicine of the Voting Rights Act is still constitutional. And the court ends up dividing five to four. And what it says is, you know, Congress can absolutely still play a role like this. But if you look at the, the, the actual specifics of the Voting Rights Act, Congress has continued to approve it over time, but they haven't updated the formula that sets which states are covered by that preclearance requirement, which states actually have to go to the national government to have their, vote, their new voting laws approved. And so if Congress wants to do that, they have to pass a new law with a new formula you can't keep using a formula that's from the 1970s. 
Um, and so that's, you know, in the end, it, the, the majority ends up rooting this in the in, in state's traditional role in elections and voting. And also what, what they call the doctrine of equal sovereignty of the states, which is the, it, what this basically says is the Voting Rights Act is treating different states differently. And Congress needs a better reason to do it than this very, very old formula. That's what the majority says. The dissent, which is written by the late Justice Ginsburg, uh, and, and uh, the court divides five to four on this. What Justice Ginsburg says in response is one, Kotz, you know, South Carolina versus Kotzenbach, we decided that this is fine under that. Two, the Voting Rights Act as reauthorized is consistent with the 15th Amendment's text and history. It's within the, within the core of pa the powers that the Reconstruction founders gave to Congress. Three, the Voting Rights Act has really worked over time. It's allowed more and more African-Americans to vote. And then finally, there's this famous quote she has here where she says, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes. It's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are getting wet. And what we see here again between the majority and the set are just these classic questions of what powers to the national government, what powers to the states, how do the amendments transform that? And you know, just to, just to end with a brief code here, Kirk, because I know we're just about out of time. It's not unlike, you know, th these, these, these questions aren't unlike a lot of the questions we're seeing right now in the age of COVID. We're seeing a range of constitutional questions raised about how do we carry out elections and how do we, you know, what, how do we carry out elections in the middle of a pandemic? What sort of constitutional challenges might we bring to laws that were on the books before the pandemic, arguing that the situation has changed and we need to change the rules versus how much do we want to just make sure clear rules are in place? We don't want to change them at the last minute. We don't want voters to be confused. And so it's sort of this classic question of formal, you know, state's authority over voting and a desire for clear rules versus a constitutional right to vote and how, um, how those rules might be shaped by constitutional requirements in different situations. And courts come out differently on these things. These are not easy questions at all. Um, they're not easy questions in a, in, in, a, in a normal year without a pandemic. These sorts of challenges happen before every election, uh, just all the more so given the additional variables we see uh, with the challenges on the ground. So I think that's awesome. I just, I'm so excited for the students because you guys, you all get to live in this giant moment in history. I mean, as many things are not fun right now, this is pretty interesting and this is pretty amazing and you're watching history unfold in front of you. So remember when we talk about voting rights in America and we're coming into the next two weeks and a pre huge presidential election, now you can understand and see where is voting rights in the original constitution and where it's not is, and then how have the amendments incorporated more and more people into the right to vote but where's the balance, like Tom said, between the states having power and then the overarching power of who's able to vote? And all these questions are something that we need to understand when we look out of elections in America and we understand who can vote, when can they vote? And the key kind of big takeaway around this is that people most often think with voting, and I ask the question like, can you vote over time? Most people think, oh, it just got better and better. And the reality of voting and who can vote kind of zigzags over time, which is so important. We need to look at why, when, and how, and then see where we are today and what's the balance. So it's a completely different world today. This election is unlike anyone that we've ever had before. So what a great time to live. What a great time to watch history unfold and get into the action. You guys may not be able to vote, but you totally can drive the conversation and engage in it. So thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, students. We're gonna end class, but if you have any questions, hold tight and we will wrap up and we will answer those. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Curry. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Milo. I'm gonna officially do that. I'm gonna stop the share and I think I have to stop the live. Thank you, Lorelei. Uh, okay, there is one qu uh, question in the Q&A that I just popped.